<laughs> so uh, speaking of Portland, that is where Daniel Bro and I grew up. And, uh, you know, we lived there for 30 years, more, more or less. And then we decided to travel at that time. I just want to give a little bit of a backstory about how yeah. we met you, because it's actually a really fascinating story and a funny story. So I'll try and condense it down. We were living in Portland. We were um, trying to get over our addictions unsuccessfully, but trying. And we were researching stuff on health and nutrition and lifestyle habits to become a better person and clean up your act and all this. So that's how we found you online because you were, you've always been prolific ever since we found you online, just constantly putting out videos and talks about health and nutrition. And so I was really consuming your content. And then I heard that you were going to be at a conference in Los Angeles. And so I was like to Daniel, I said, we should go down there and just participate in it, get out and meet some people, you know? And so he said, okay. So we decided to hitchhike down there. We got rid of the few things that we had. We had a little bit of money and we just hit started hitchhiking from Portland down to Los Angeles. And we showed up at this, what was it? The Hilton hotel. It was Hilton yeah. hotel. So a nice, big, clean, bright hotel with like, I don't know, more than a thousand people there. And here comes Daniel and I pretty much barefoot and with our backpacks on, we show up at this conference and just start volunteering. And that's where we met you. And there's some other things I want to say about that, but there's something I haven't told you since ever that I wanted to share with you. It's a really funny story about the first time you and I actually met. Uh oh. Yeah, it was super awkward for me. I, I'm curious if you remember this. So um, I went to a bathroom in the lobby just to go pee. And I walk in there. Barefoot. I, yeah. And I go pee. And then as I'm walking out, you're walking in and, and it, it happened so fast. You just passed me and your eyes went down to my feet and then your face went like this. <laughs> you were, Cause you were disgusted that I was walking in the bathroom. In barefoot. The bathroom barefoot. And, and I was like, so crestfallen at the time I was like, Oh, oh. David Vitalis like, look, gave me that gnarly look. Cause oh, I just man. wanted to... Well, if you guys had had a pit bull back then, I would have assumed <laughs> That we you were, were going town to town as crust punks. I remember you guys because you had big backpacks too. Too like you guys were roughing it, and uh, yeah, you you didn't come in looking like um, you'd just been to the salon. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just do now to... though. I do now though. Yeah, yeah now yeah. you look yeah. very cleaned up, of course. <laughs> so anyway, um, I just want to say that that was difficult for me at the time, but I've completely gotten over it because I would have given Obviously. myself the same look because. At the time, I just wanted to be barefoot, and I didn't really know a lot about hygiene, I guess. But to me now, walking into a, and I'm sure the listeners agree, walking into a bathroom, a public bathroom barefoot, I wouldn't do that. Jesus Christ, that Dude, is unbelievable. I've never been to a, a frequently used <laughs> urinal that's got a dry floor in front of it. Dude, it's insane, man. But that was It's funny. amazing how the stream makes its way back to the person and some of that bypasses the edge of the urinal. And I don't know why we haven't, I don't know if people need to stand closer or what, but it's always wet. I hate even in flip-flops where you're like, oh, it's a little close. And, you yeah. know, I think a little context for the listeners. I'm like, I've been one of those barefoot advocates over the years. Right. A yeah. major one. So uh, I'm sure that was like a little bit added to it a little bit. Like, hey, this guy's been like promoting this idea. And then he's looking at me like I'm a grind bag because I'm- yeah. Yeah, you get it. So yeah, we were definitely like, but it, we were going overboard with the barefoot thing. It was a bit too much. <laughs> There's yeah. a limit. Well, I think we were part of a culture at the time where everybody was overboard. Yeah. If you were like a real part of it, if you were, you know, I mean, there was a lot of people who were accessory to it, but um, something I've been thinking about for years, I think I mentioned this to you, uh, David, at one point recently, is that I really hope that at some point, I like fantasize someone wants to make a documentary about that time. Cause now you see a lot of documentaries about, especially containing a lot of found footage from things that have happened in the past. Great example. Did you guys see wild, wild country? Oh yeah. Osho? Yeah. Like, that was good. something like that about that scene at the time. Cause some very wild shit was going on. Right. I mean, mm. I can remember some very wild times and Something that's interesting to me is this is, seems to happen whenever there's an ideology around mm -hmm. something. And certainly we were part of this like very multifaceted ideological world at the time is that 
And I've been hearing Elon Musk talk about this a little bit. He keeps saying that the most likely outcome is the most ironic one. Hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard him say that. Mm-hmm. But um, similarly, I see it like this. Things, when they get ideological, tend to become the almost the opposite of what they're supposed to be. For sure. So people would have looked at that scene and been like, oh, wow, raw food veganism. This is going to be people who live a super clean life. They they go to bed early. They exercise a lot. They take the you. The reality was what like sex, drugs, and rock and roll in that scene. That scene was outrageous, and people were doing many healthful practices, but the overall lifestyle was pushing people into extreme imbalance. If you were really deep in that world, no one was sleeping, and it was just like up all night partying and a lot of tobacco use, a lot of drug use, a lot of you know what I mean, but. Oh yeah. The out from the outside, everybody thought this was like this puritanical health scene. Oh man, so we were raising it up. After, after it's those like if you were, you know, the Osho world. You know, it's like, oh okay, these are people. It's like a Hindu type of Indian philosophical peace religion. But then you see what was going on in the background. They're poisoning people in town. They're amassing weapons. It's like things become the opposite of what they're supposed to be <laughs> when there's a rigidity about the mm-hmm. ideology. Totally, and it becomes a mockery of itself. In that world we were in certainly exemplifies it yeah there's that other wow. story that is kind of the not as bad as the barefoot in the bathroom thing but <clears throat> this is probably our third <laughs> conference or something like that and every every night after the conference it was like people would come back to our room you know and we're just like draining bottles of wine and like cases of beer and i remember running into you in the elevator you had just left my room and we i was coming back from a smoke break and you were like Please tell me you weren't in your room snorting Shilajit. Because we had like powdered Shilajit and we were doing fucking rails of it. <laughs> I remember one time at the Eden Hot Springs Hotel. And this was the time when everybody was into that stuff called Ormus. Do you remember that? The oh, yeah. rearranged monoatomic elements. Yep. So I had this little vial that I had paid some ungodly amount of money for this like luminous white, almost iridescent powder. And I come into my hotel room and there's three topless girls snor- had broken into my room and they're snorting it, <laughs> you know? And it's like, this is supposed to be like, what is this scene that I'm in, you know? But it was, um, anyway, I think one day there might be a documentary and I would love to get to That'll be interviewed be awesome. for it because yeah. I just, I have a lot of, I have a lot of stories that I would love to see the light of day one day. Yeah. Like kind of at the same time as when I, became that private chef for the billionaire Peter Nygaard. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, that was crazy too. There's a whole side story. It's an octopus, right? It's like, there's a lot of tent, like a lot of, um, when there's that much insane energy, it attracts a lot more insane energy. And there's all these side tangential stories that were connected to that world. Nygaard being one of those people who was, had a connection to that scene. And it's just interesting. All the different, ways that energy spilled out of what we were doing because we are generating oh, yeah. quite a quite a lot of quite a lot of energy and yeah. it spilled into a lot of different quarters and a lot yeah. of it became mainstream which is also mm-hmm. kind of shocking and wild to me yeah and i feel like um those were all examples of addictive behaviors and addictive yeah. psychology you know that we bring to the table yes and we bring it we bring it to goji berries and all of a sudden yes. we're, we're you know we're gonna make this whole fucking world in a really dysfunctional way. Well, there's this idea that you can eat yourself into wholeness or you could eat yourself into a kind of being a perfected being, a luminous entity, or even an immortal. If you just eat Mm -hmm. the right food, right? That was what was going on there. If you can eat the right herbs and the right food, you can bypass all of the really difficult personal work of facing trauma, of facing down your addictions, and instead of having to do that work, you could just eat goji berries and shilajit and then you don't even have to think about it, right? That was almost right. the mentality, not mm-hmm. obviously explicitly stated, but implicitly, mm-hmm. it was like if I eat the right food and I do the right yoga practice or whatever it is, all that stuff will just get dealt with. Right. And I wanted to say also in reference to your sort of opening statements, Daniel, that because you were talking about how difficult this work is and how you're facing, even though you've done a lot of this and been in this work for many, many years, now you're mm-hmm. facing a whole new round of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And I just wanted to say like, that's why we call them blind spots. Right. And you, cause you just don't know. And at right. the time, looking back to myself then, right. There were so many things that I could not see about myself that I get, it's cringy to me. I mean, I feel mm-hmm. shame. I like look at myself at the time and things that I would do in the world. And I'm just like, I'm embarrassed and ashamed that I didn't see myself for what I was. In fact, I had a very, um, I like had rose colored glasses about myself, right. mm-hmm. but then I saw lots of bad behavior in other people. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I was not even remotely aware of my own contribution to it. Right. You know, and that's blind spots. And so I thought at the time, and I thought this about many things, that was just one thing I've been involved with in my life. But many times in my life, I thought if I lived the right way, I could fix these things about myself. Mm-hmm. And now I know the truth of it. I think it's the truth of it, which is that I have to actually walk through that really uncomfortable, difficult stuff. I have to face down. Mm-hmm. You know, you said like the body keeps the score. It's like, I've been seeing a really uh, fantastic uh, body worker here and he's like a Cairo uh, by training, but he's specifically trained in a bunch of these other modalities. And one of the things he does is a lot of x-ray and then uses some kind of body scanning software. Mm -hmm. And so that the work he's doing is extremely targeted. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people over the years who've done willy nilly work on me or whatever. Anyway, I like this because it's like, I'm looking at the x-ray. He's looking at the x-ray. We know what needs to change in my body. So he's been releasing some chronically stuck areas, particularly at the bottom and top of my spine. And I'll leave there and I'll be driving home. It's a long drive for me. Hmm. And I'll just have this melancholy come over me. Hmm. And I'm like, what is this, man? My life is, I have an incredible wife. I mean, I won the wife lottery. I have an incredible job. I mean, I make a TV show that's all just based around what I love. It's like, I'm, I'm so blessed. Yeah. I have just an incredible home. I have awesome friends, hobbies, like living a really good life. I don't have anything I'm sad about. And it's like, what is this? And it's like, Mm -hmm. this is the emotions that caused those bones to stick together when I seized up out of fear and Mm -hmm. trauma and abuse and neglect and all the things that I went through. And these patterns took place in my body and I've just carried them ever since. Yeah. And somebody gets in there and breaks that free and I got to go through those feet. It's like, I got it. They can't leave your body till you face them down. Right. You know what yeah, I mean? That's... And, and what you end up doing is of course, as you guys know, is like, well, I'll self-medicate this anxiety away. I'll self-medicate this sadness or this shame or whatever it is. That's, and it doesn't have to be drugs and alcohol. As you guys know, it can literally be goji berries. If you want it to be, if you dig a deep enough hole for yourself, you can make it into anything. Yeah. So, now I'm, it's kind of a, I'm really into, um, endurance in my fitness right now. Mm-hmm. And so I often say like, you know, I leave my inner bitch behind at like 20 minutes of whatever yeah. I'm doing. So let's say I'm running and I'm going to run for an hour. It's not like the first 20 minutes are fun. They kind right. of suck. And mm-hmm. all this, the voices in my head for reasons why I don't need to do this. Right. But then I've learned that when I beat that part, it's like I leave that body behind and and I run past it into freedom yeah. or bike past it into freedom. So I'm learning to look forward to the discomfort yeah. because on the other side is a kind of freedom. And totally. that makes it a lot easier to deal with like the childhood stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like my mommy stuff and my daddy stuff that like I have never wanted to look at. I just wanted to be done with. Or didn't even know that I was you over. had to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And now I realize, oh, it will suck going through that. But uh, but on the other side, I'll have that same freedom that I feel, you know, running or swimming or whatever it is. I love that example because I do love, I haven't been into running for a while, but I'm looking forward to getting back into it now that I'm sober and like not waking up, just like feeling like a total piece of shit. <laughs> um, running, I love running for, you know, at least five to 10 miles but you're right for like the first 20 minutes, you're just like getting into the groove. And then after that, it's effortless. Yeah. And ecstatic, kind of ecstatic, right? Super ecstatic. And I have the same experience when I get into the emotional processing Mm -hmm. and some of the people that live on the land that I live with, I mean, they've seen me for days and I'm just sitting under these super tall cottonwood trees, reading this book, sitting in meditation, just processing this stuff. 
because uh, once you get past that first little hump, the the rewards are just immense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. 